I have a mighty need to talk about a specific literary trope, which I see in a ton of stuff, but which came up recently in a series that I am currently reading. And because this is my channel and I can do what I want, you all have to come along too. I recently read the Percy Jackson and the Olympians series, the first five books in the Riordan verse, partially because my partner's hyperfixation is this universe and I like to be supportive, and partially because I'm going to be using the first book in a future class I'm going to be teaching on popular literature, and there's a ton to talk about in it. So, this is your one and only warning about spoilers for the entirety of the first five books, Percy Jackson and the Olympians, as well as at least the first two of the second series, Heroes of Olympus. I'm not going to be doing a huge analysis of the story or like a close reading or anything like that this time, this time, so much as I want to talk about this trope. So your chances to leave unspoiled are dwindling... Okay, here we go. Percy Jackson is the son of Poseidon, one of the three very important gods of Olympus, and he starts out, like, actually pretty strong in the story, like, right off the bat. And from there, he basically only skyrockets higher in the... powerfulness... metrics, I suppose? Among this kid's many feats are causing Mount St. Helens to blow up, Mount St. Helens is about to blow up, it's gonna be a fine swell day, fighting the god of war Ares one-on-one -on -one and not dying, uh, tearing off the horn of a minotaur barehanded and puncturing its brain through its skull, killing it, and having a body count in the thousands. And he starts this series off when he's like 12 years old. The longer the story goes, obviously the more impressive and powerful he's going to become because he's the main character of at least the first five books and a pretty centralized character for the rest of the entire universe. And... It's apparently a fandom meme, like, in, in the Percy Jackson fandom, that Percy thinks he's, like, just trying his best, and everyone else sees this sort of, like, terrifying, whirling death machine with the power to tear continents apart. And so he'll, like, go out and, like, crush a sea monster with the ocean, and then come back up and be like, whew, you guys want to get donuts? And everyone else is like... At the end of the first series, Percy has to one-on-one -on -one fight with the Titan Kronos, which, okay, actually, hang on, S sidetrack for a moment. We all know that Kronos and Kronos are two different guys in mythology, right? From what I read, there's a sort of middling consensus as to whether they were consciously identified with each other by the Greeks or not, because etymologically they have different roots, but are almost identically written, save for the very first consonant. Kronos, the CH one, the one that we romanized into the, the CH sort of sound, that's the one that controls time. He's got domain over the cycles of time, and therefore or the whole, like, uh, cycle of the seasons and that kind of business, and he is portrayed as an old man with, like, calloused hands from having worked long, long, long times. Cronus, on the other hand, that's the Titan Lord who killed his father with a scythe and became ruler of the skies before Zeus did the same thing to him. Apparently, during the Renaissance, the conscious choice to identify them together, partially because their names sounded so similar, I suppose, as one being became much more prominent, and as a result, now we've got the imagery of Father Time, holding a scythe. That's some, like, weird syncretism there, but that's ostensibly to show the cyclical time by the means of a harvest cycle, I guess. I mean, we see him in, like, Poor Richard's Almanac and all of that, and those guys are really concerned with when you can and cannot harvest your grain, so. The fact that those two are conflated as being the same guy in the Riordan verse is... fine, I guess. Like, it's not a big deal, really, but I thought it was weird that after all the apparently pretty deep research that Riordan does for the characterization of, like, gods and titans and minor deities and that kind of business in order to be able to modernize them and make them fun to read, this is a detail that he either missed or decided specifically not to address. 
Anyway, Kronos in universe, Kronos is the King Titan, and his whole deal with coming back to life after having been sliced to bits and tossed into Tartarus spells the end of Western civilization because the gods will all be destroyed, Mount Olympus will be destroyed, and the gods are, ostensibly, what makes up civilization in the West. And Percy basically bodies him. Now, obviously, book one Percy would never have been able to do this. There would be no journey to getting stronger and becoming more skilled and getting more experience and having more practice in anything if he just, like, woke up one day, Poseidon was like, boom, you've got all the powers forever. Go get him, tiger. I mean, this isn't one punch man. It's an actual, like, hero's journey sort of story for middle grade readers, at least at the beginning. And then also, we are shown a whole bunch of times leading up to like after Kronos gets a body we are shown that his body is basically invulnerable like his skin simply doesn't pierce his bones don't break he gets like a building dropped on him at one point if I'm not mistaken and then he's just fine later he's got this like horrifying weapon made both of celestial bronze and of normal steel that separates souls from bodies on like a permanent level and he's functionally invincible and debatably functionally immortal also as well and how then would anyone be able to fight this guy how does percy end up being able to fight him by going to the underworld and taking a dip in the river styx to get the same powers that achilles had which Okay, um, sidetrack again. Did y'all know that Achilles being invincible because of the being dipped in the River Styx myth is actually, like, several centuries newer than his story in the Iliad and all of that? That version of the story is from the first century common era in this book, The Achilliad, where the Iliad is actually from around the 8th century BCE. And what's cool is that, like, the the whole dip in the sticks isn't even the only version of a story about how he got his immortality. There's a reference in the 3rd century common era Argonautica about how his mother Thetis, instead of using the underworld river, uh, like, rubbed ambrosia all over his body and then set him on fire to burn away the mortal parts. And then, like with the other story, had to bail on it when Peleus showed up to interrupt her because Peleus was like, what are you doing to our kid? And she was like, all right, I guess you're stupid. I'm leaving. Peace out. And goes back into the ocean. In the Iliad, though, where we get most of his story, he actually gets wounded like like a normal person a whole bunch of times. And the earliest story that we have about his inability to be hurt, save for that little like back of the ankle business, is from the Achilleid several hundred years later. So, like, whenever we get the depictions of his death being, like, you know, uh, painted on pottery or whatever like that, they're all, like, having been shot in the torso or shot multiple times in the torso. That's new. But anyway, okay, okay. Back to the story. So Percy goes to the River Styx, and he has a chat with the ghost of Achilles, who tells him, oh, it's a curse, and actually, it sucks. But Percy's got a job to do. And so he takes a dip right in, he gains the general invulnerability that Achilles is said to have had. Why did Percy decide to do this? It's because that is what Kronos made Luke, the traitorous demigod vessel he was using to reincarnate himself, also did in preparation to house the Titan's essence. And it was basically two Colossus from X-Men fighting each other, and neither could really harm the other, except Kronos is an ancient, unstoppable force with a horrifying, soul-destroying instrument, and Percy is a 16-year-old, at the time, annoying teenager. But, even so, Percy fights Kronos to a standstill. Some story stuff happens, and Luke's consciousness comes back long enough for Luke to be able to identify the one spot on his body, the Achilles spot, uh, that one weak spot, so that he can kill himself, and he takes Annabeth's dagger and does it, and the world is saved. However, this still leaves Percy with the Achilles powers at the end of the five books, which makes him functionally immortal in that he cannot be directly harmed by weaponry, even celestial bronze, which is the specific god and monster harming stuff. If the stories had ended there, it probably would have been fine. 
I mean, we would have had, like, Percy the Invulnerable go back to Camp Half-Blood, keep being heroic, maybe do a couple more quests off-screen or something, end up growing up, living out a happy life of killing monsters and doing cool stuff, but that would be outside of the pages of any of the books that we would be reading. We would be able to imagine that future as something that happens without it being explicitly confirmed that that's what happens on the pages of the book. And that would be fine because that is the end of a story. That, like, Percy saves the world, the Titans have been destroyed, or, or defeated at the very least, the world is fine again, the gods all have to recognize all their kids and everything, right? But there's a problem, and that problem is that Riordan has got sequels coming out his ears. And Percy is too important and interesting of a character, too recognizable and attached to the franchise, as well as the readers whom he targets for his intended audience, right? If we got more Riordan stuff that didn't have any Percy in it whatsoever, it probably wouldn't even be that good and like it would have dropped off pretty quickly because everybody likes Percy everybody likes that character the story is great but everybody wants to see more stuff that happens with Percy and this happens a lot with any sort of like single heroic character focused story series like look at uh Jim Butcher's stuff the Dresden files if it weren't for the fact that Harry Dresden was a cool character it wouldn't matter who was doing those stories because like you know Jim Butcher knows what he's doing when he writes a story he can make a story interesting but he wrote his main character his totally not Constantine we promise Harry Dresden into existence and everybody likes him so now you gotta keep stories coming or sir arthur conan doyle did the same thing with sherlock holmes he even killed the mother he straight up killed sherlock holmes because he was like i don't want to do this anymore i'm done i'm bored i don't want to do these stories anymore and then the entirety of the english public went i think you've made a mistake there i think I think you meant to write more of these stories, didn't you? And so he had to bring him back because, uh, yeah, like, do people remember his, his story about, like, an ancient mummy uh, that was looking for a ring or something? Like, no, they don't remember any of his other stuff because Sherlock Holmes is the important character, and that's what happened to Percy Jackson. So it has to have Percy in it. Percy has to be part of the main characters, and there have to be stakes, right? So he's too important to get rid of, which means he's got to be brought back as a main character in the sequels, the next five books. This presents the One Punch Man problem again, right? At the beginning of a brand new series of books, where the story must start from nothing again, Percy is already literally invulnerable and already has all of his powers. And while we don't really see hide nor hair of him during the first book of Heroes of Olympus, for good reasons, I suppose, the second one brings him back into focus as the main character, and he's been given amnesia, but retains all his powers, his fighting prowess, and his beef with Ares, which is probably my favorite portion of his character, nonetheless. He's being chased and hounded by some Gorgons for several weeks through, like, wilderness and cities and all that with no memories, and they aren't staying dead when he kills them with his magic sword that he still has, but he also is unable to be killed either way by them, so it's a weird stalemate. And then the trope appears. Convenient depowering. In order to preserve Percy's character as a main driver of plot, he has to be brought to a place where there are stakes again. While he's invulnerable, there, there could be stakes, I guess, but those stakes are significantly lower and less important, impactful, I guess, unless those threats come directly for his loved ones or the camp or whatever. And those threats do happen, but like it's difficult to make them as real because the solution to most of the threats in this world is go to the important place and beat up the guy. Now, Percy has Poseidon god powers, crazy strong versions of them, insane fighting prowess, like speed, strength, general invulnerability because of the Achilles curse. He's really good at that specific way of solving problems. So the stakes kind of aren't that high for him, right? 
what does Riordan do? You invoke a drama-preserving handicap in a long-term manner by removing the superpower that makes the hero invulnerable. That's where we get it. This is a mixing of two extremely related tropes, the convenient depowering and the drama-preserving handicap, which both combine to make what I guess I'm calling the sequel-permitting power loss. A brother-in-law, I guess, to the sequel reset, which sequel reset you can look up on TV tropes. Percy does this when he loses the Achilles powers. Wolverine has this happen when he gets uh, a run of his comics back in the 80s. I think it was when he gets his skeleton ripped out by Magneto during the Fatal Attractions arc. Link from The Legend of Zelda does this at the beginning of Majora's Mask because that's a direct sequel to Ocarina of Time. It even happens to the Ghostbusters between the first and second films, though I guess that's not really powers and more just all of their like resources and their reputation and stuff being taken down. But it still puts them back at a position where we know who they are and what they do, but they're not an instant solution to the problem anymore. The heroes were, at the end of their last story, very strong, very powerful, very influential, or whatever it was that made them get their story done, but they need a convenient way to stay relevant, but not overpowered, so that the sequel can happen. I think for me, the most egregious and recognizable example for people from my generation of this trope comes in the form of the Pokemon anime, where every time Ash finishes one region and he's got this cool team of rad Pokemon, he leaves his team of Elite Four beating leveled Pokemon with Professor Oak, and just takes along Pikachu with him to start from basically nothing and get ritually curb stomped again and again and again, and again, and again, every time he goes anywhere. This finally gets stopped at the, like, near the very end of the Ash era, when he finally is able to, like, go back and use all the Pokemon that he's collected and all that, right? But, like, every time, it just resets him back to zero, and, like, you don't need to. Nothing in the story is forcing you to, but you have to be relevant again. And if you're not brought back down to a level where, like, the, you know, Gen 4 version of Rattata and Gen 4 version of Caterpie are a threat again, nobody's going to want to watch it because now the, the solution is just Ash beats up everybody. Now, this is distinct from the instances where someone gains, like, hella power in a short period, only to have it removed to maintain the status quo of the series or whatever, which is a common plot in episodic stuff. And you'll see this happen in, like, children's cartoons and in, like, episodic weeklies and that kind of business where somebody will be like, oh, there's a, a, a big thing and we have to figure out a way to do it. And then somebody gains the power to be able to beat this guy. And then they go and beat him. And then they get rid of the power and everything is fine. And everything is good again. And it's completely normal. And they've gone right back to where they were. In that kind of example, the power they get is useful for overcoming the current bad guy of the week and would be game-breakingly broken if they were to keep it. But there's some convenient contrivance as to why they don't keep it at the end of the episode or chapter or volume or whatever it is, whatever media you're using, and everything has to go back to normal. That is a trope that has roots dug so deep in so many genres that it's inevitable to see in basically everything. But... It's not the kind of, like, big-level, character-changing stuff that I'm actually talking about here, right? Now, in Percy Jackson and the Olympians and into Heroes of Olympus, Percy's only really got the Achilles curse for, like, a comparatively short amount of time in comparison to, like, the rest of the books. He gets it in the last book and then loses it immediately, like, 20 pages into the next time that he shows up. But it's literally the culmination of the entire plot that rides on him having this power. There isn't a way to defeat Kronos without him being made invincible in the exact same way that Kronos was, but Percy legitimately fights against this idea for at least an entire volume of writing before he agrees to it. And even then, this is ridiculous, even then, the, the stupid kid who suggests that they go down to the underworld and have him take a dip in the sticks in the first place, goes back on it and is like, um, actually, maybe this might not be the greatest idea 
that I've ever had, the, the, the kind of idea that we thought that it would be, but he has to, and he does, he, he takes a little dip, and he gets the ability to be 99.9% .9 unharmable, except for the, like, tiny one centimeter spot in the center of his back, and that's the tipping factor for the Half-Blood team against the Titans. It's a curse, or so Achilles says, and I suppose there's, like, some manner of in-universe explanation as to why it's actually a curse. Like, it makes you... Harder, better, faster, stronger, right? Better at fighting, more resilient, you don't take damage, you still get tired, I guess. You get tired a lot faster. You can still feel pain, but it is significantly lessened, right? But, like, that's the thing. You get tired a lot faster. And you can still technically be harmed by other stuff, just not, like, combat, not, like, weaponry. Fire still works. Poison might ostensibly still work. Uh, there are a couple things that are explored as a possibility. Uh, you could just get vaporized by a god, because that's always a possibility in the Pijo universe as well. And there's one tiny point on your body, somewhere, where you choose to be vulnerable, and if that spot is damaged in any way, you instantly die. This doesn't feel like a curse to me at all, really in my humble opinion, but I'm no expert on curses, so, you know, don't don't take me as an expert on this. But, okay, so, this is the point where Percy is the most powerful he has ever been, because this allows him to use his water powers alongside his being completely unkillable, even if it's for shorter periods of time. He does have, like, a, a power limiter sort of built in already in that he gets tired a lot faster, but even that limited power would be insane for him to start the next series of books with. Because he would just be like, oh, there's more titans, let me just go fight them, it'll be fine. We can't do that. We have to find a way to bring him back down to a relatively low power level. Relatively. For Percy, that relatively low level is still stupid strong. He still got his amazing god water powers and his ability to fight insanely well, despite not remembering basically anything, but that is a level of power that can be managed within the narrative. After all, it's a sequel, not a reboot. We can't have him get completely depowered. This level of power is matched by the other complementary characters in the story, or, well, matched by one of them and approached by the others, I guess, so it's an acceptable level. Obviously, the main character is allowed to be more powerful than the others because they're the main character. I personally really enjoy stories where the main character is actually not as powerful as some of the other characters that might be on their cast or whatever. There is an anime that I watched a long time ago called Gakuen Arisu, which is another one of those, like, kids with magic powers go to a school in order to be shielded from the world, be able to fight bad guys and all that sort of business, and this happens, like, way before My Hero Academia, but basically this girl goes in and she apparently doesn't have any powers, but she gets accepted anyway on the grounds that they can tell that she's got something, and what it turns out she's got is the power to turn off other people's powers. And that makes her not that much of an issue, because she doesn't really understand how to do it. And so she's very easily affected by everyone else's powers, and she doesn't know how to make hers work for like a really long time until it finally becomes important, and then boom, suddenly it's, it's actually good. And that's the, the character power-up level, that's the taking the level in Achilles that happens, right? I've, this is the third sidetrack for this entire script. Imagine if you could finish Pokemon Blue version. And then you bloop, bloop, put in your copy of Silver and instantly load up your team from Blue version at the very beginning of the game. And they're like level 85 or whatever it is that you trained them up to. That is what leaving Percy with the Achilles powers would be like. There's a possibility that there might be some minor threats. But for the most part, your level 85 Blastoise or whatever is just going to march over all the competition. Like you go to the electric gym and it's like, oh, you brought out a water type Pokemon. Let me just get out my, you know, electric thing. And they put out, you know, Ampharos or something. And you're like, ah, yes, your level... 35 Ampharos, let me just squish with my Blastoise, who, despite being weak against it, is just insanely overpowered. That's what this would be like. So you had to do something. This trope makes it such that it's possible to 
continue a narrative thread with a character that was once completely brokenly overpowered, while still leaving the possibility for stakes to be high. Heroes of Olympus subverts a common version of this trope, by the way, excellently, where the main character has amnesia and as a result of the amnesia does not remember that they are crazy powerful and they just basically become like a, a normal person again because they don't know they've got their powers or whatever. Heroes of Olympus subverts this, subverts this by giving him amnesia but letting him keep his powers and they do actually use it to the hero's advantage in Percy Jackson and the Olympians with a titan who gets dipped in the river Letha, destroying his memory of being a titan and turning him into something like an amicable idiot. I don't actually remember what happened to him, but I do think it's very funny. Does this trope do what it's supposed to do? Or does it fall into the trap of like trying too hard to make things continue to be profitable and end up destroying the goodwill of the audience by changing stuff too much? That question hangs on the methodology by which the author or director or creator or whatever does the thing. I think in Riordan's case, he does it well enough, because we don't spend a ton of time with Percy having the invulnerability on page. We don't spend a ton of time getting used to him being completely invulnerable, and it's only a partial reduction in his powers rather than a full reset. Like in Disgaea 2, for instance, uh, Etna, one of the characters from Disgaea 1, is there, and she shows up, and she gets de-leveled from 9,999 all the way down to 1, which is funny in the context of the game, but it also kind of sucks because it's like, oh yeah, I was crazy powerful, now I have to start back from zero. It's kind of like the whole isekai thing, where like, I'm a normal person, I get hit by truck kun, I get reborn as a baby, and I get to keep my brain, but I'm a baby. That sucks for me, but at least it's something, right? That full reset sort of thing takes the one step away from it and it just it says like I'm not going to be completely reduced back to absolute zero because if I'm being reduced completely back to absolute zero then what's the point of keeping me as the main character in the first place right Riordan uses this as a means to make the story continuable without it being annoyingly easy to fix every problem that shows up while still retaining the mood and feel of the original story and not losing anything in the process. That is what makes this a good example of the convenient depowering trope. Anyway, thank you everyone for coming and listening to me yell about this thing. If you haven't watched the Percy Jackson stuff, like normally I would tell you that uh, Disney can blow goats, but like the new Percy Jackson show is actually kind of good. If you found a way to pirate it, don't tell anybody. Uh, but it's it's. It's decent. Go go watch it. The books are also quite good, especially having been written so long ago as they are. They still hold up for the most part. Uh, and the drama is decent. The story is good. You can see the growth of the author as he continues writing his books. I recommend them. If you're interested in going to read them, they're all over the place. You can get them for crazy cheap from, like, used bookstores and stuff. I do think that there is room to do, like, a scholarly-level close reading of several of the themes in the Percy Jackson and the Olympians thing. That might be a thing that we do again in the future. Also, sorry for me sounding so nasally this entire time. I have been having the worst allergies that I've had in a really long time, but I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any opinions on the things that we have talked about, please put them in the comments or come to the Discord where we've got a channel that we can uh, discuss literary stuff in. Yeah. Anyway, thank you guys for coming and watching. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, the like and subscribe buttons are waiting below this video for you to click on them. You've been on YouTube for long enough to know what those things do, I hope. But do click them. It does help me out by letting me know that people are watching the thing and that you actually enjoy it. We'll see you next time.